Good afternoon, everyone. Today is June 26, 2017. This is episode number 28 of Mini Ice Age Conversations. And today I have with me Sasha Dobler. He runs the website abrupturthchanges.com. And how we connected was the amazing ebook that he put out, Black Death and the Abrupt Earth Changes in the 14th Century. As you know, I'm trying to connect the timeline with the changes in the Grand Solar Minimum and what we can expect. And during this exact same time frame of the 14th century, we had a Grand Solar Minimum. So I've been interested in this time frame. And then lo and behold, this 100 page plus PDF comes out that Sasha wrote that was so well researched it took over a year and I'm having him on today so we can discuss more about this time and some of the similarities of what's going on with the Earth's climate right now and also the way it's repeating as it did during the same time in the 1300s or the 14th century. Sasha, thanks for joining me today. Hi, David. How are you? So good. You know, I read that book from cover to cover, and a lot of other of my subscribers had read it as well. There's so many similarities to what we're seeing today with the changes in the, just the general climate. So I wanted to continue to ask some questions also about the increase in meteors that we're seeing right now. And they saw the same thing back then. And the research that you've done, you did so much more than I have, so I'd like you, if you could, to explain you know, what happened at that time and the plagues that came about because of the meteors and how they're connected to the change in the atmosphere and just different things like this. So I'll let you take over and please feel free to talk about whatever you like. Okay, I'll start from the Black Death itself, from the uh, pandemic, and then uh, note that there were all these uh, climate change going on, it's quite severe. And I found out that um, I would have to distinguish between two events, the main um, pandemic and the culmination of different earth changes at the time, earthquakes and meteor sightings, comet. So it seems the biggest the loss of life and the most perturbations in all the Earth were right in these years. But then I also found uh, changes that can take place decades before, starting in the 1290s. What were some of those changes that led up to the larger changes that had the biggest effect on the societies of that time? So the 1290s, what was happening? Are there any similarities that we see today that would have been equal for the 1290s when we're going to move into something uh, greater and, and something much more uh, say amplified? Yes, pretty much. Uh, the solar cycle showed um, large similarities uh, going to the wolf minimum. And there was also an increase in CO2 before the temperatures collapsed in around the 1350s. And volcanoes in the 1250s, there was a large series of volcanoes going up about three to ten times the amount of uh, Volcanic sulfur was ejected into the atmosphere than in any other centuries in the last 1500 years. So what the ramifications were, there was the Great Famine in 1315 already that um, was by conservative estimate uh, killed about one third of the European population at least. 
And that's usually completely left out when talking about the Black Death, when the Black Death is considered to be just the cause of a pathogen. Usually it's attributed to a bacterium, but others have suggested virus. So there were lots of changes going on, and now harvest lots of rain the wet two years that then led to this famine in working fifteen to eighteen in some places went down to twenty one and lots of wars going down as would be expected. And this just continued and um, climate have all and the actual culmination of the 1381 seems to be directly um, connected to a similar event or a chain of events, probably crossing a meter stream. That was really, uh, that's my best guess at this moment. That's what the evidence should suggest. So it's nothing I found in the middle of other southern minima. I think the two are um, connected directly, but I couldn't say that this combination and the, the abrupt increase in earthquakes and meteor sightings and also lower earthquakes. All the things that people recorded. Yeah, I can't see the same thing repeating in in the middle of each solar minimum as for maybe we find the evidence at some point. Yeah, with what you just said, if we use that as a checklist, well the auroras this year specifically have been blue and white, which they have never seen white before. Blue is rarely spotted, but it has been the main color for these energized particle events over this year, so that would be a check in the box. The increased amount of meteors as well. We're seeing that as this magnetosphere around our planet decreases along with the solar output just means that it's easier for those pieces of rock from space to penetrate our atmosphere. You know, we got snow in Russia just these last tough couple days with Murmansk, and then that summer blizzard that's coming across as we speak. These wet conditions, check. Almost everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere has been too wet for anybody to plant on time this year. That's that includes the United States, Canada, China, Russia, the EU. And we just check, check, check on all these boxes, and it seems like it's starting to match up quite a bit. Yes, it does. It matches up quite a bit, but uh, we haven't seen the meteors of the sort that really shake the ground. And, um, as are directly correlated to large earthquakes. They were speaking about earthquake swarms that rocked across Italy. And one just a um, few months before the out outbreak, the so-called outbreak of the plague, did some physical damage from Naples to Slovenia. I proposed there was an earthquake swarm rather than one shot. Uh, we haven't seen that in less than magnitude. But anything else that, they, that you just mentioned was pretty much witnessed in, in the decades ramping up to the coronavirus and all the above, Jack. Definitely. And we have the uh, crop failures here in Switzerland too, although I must say we seem to have been pretty spared 
in the last couple of months anyway from large stones but um when i when i see your videos that sounds familiar and there are definitely lots of similarities yeah there are and also the gases that you spoke of with these earthquake swarms which is one thing we didn't see yet on this planet with this grand solar minimum the gases coming out of the ground during these earthquake swarms now if we start to see that that's something that would definitely be a big red flag to say something is very very wrong can you tell everybody what was what happened with the gases coming out of the ground that were suffocating people and also possibly part of the spread of this plague there are numerous reports i did some deep digging in libraries and it's quite amazing you can find most of original sources that talk about all these uh gases and foul old odors and the material is still around it's just uh, uh, not regarded as relevant by historians when people talked about foul odors coming from the sea and then everybody all said foul odors coming from the ground so these sources are still around and what people are talking about was a fish fish dials what we see today sometimes also and from what I can tell is there wasn't any disease in either really or I would talk about diseases there's no consistent um, pattern of symptoms but basically people dropping dead from gases that come out of the ground especially after earth earthquakes and that was most of you in the early years right after 1348 so there was a accumulation which can't be attributed to gradual earth changes like uh, melting permafrost and slow release of methane but what they were talking about sounded very much like um, people being suffocated so I made some comparisons to methane release and the radon gas which is a known problem of um, gradual contamination of people's basements and radon gas can also be used as a precursor to earthquakes and hydrogen sulfide is another candidate which was attributed for the smell of rotten eggs and other foul odors that anyone was talking about and another problem was um, contaminated drinking water that's one thing many people are not uh, really focusing about. Things like uh, hydrogen sulfate can then, or water solvent can be rained out and end up in water sources. And I think that's one of the contributors that led to the assumption that someone had poisoned the wells and the Jews were accused of having poisoned the wells which is not uh, not feasible for most settings because people were drinking from rainwater wells and fountains fed from creeks it would have been would have needed a monumental task to 
purposely poison those uh, wells with whatever they had, so maybe arsenic at the time. But these reports from the contaminated groundwater are pretty consistent and gases emanating from from bodies of water. I also found a contemporary yeah. comparison. There was that incident in the 80s in Cameroon in the lake, Lake Nals, where a bubble of CO2 emerged from a volcanic lake and a still or an inactive volcanic lake and suffocated 2,000 people or so. So these things happen and if um, tectonic activity ramp up suddenly, then these things have happened at a large scale and they can happen again. Yeah, they certainly can. And John Casey's book, Upheaval, that talks about in the United States on the New Madrid Fault Zone, Every grand solar minimum, there seems to be an 8.0 earthquake, but the rest of the time, there's very little activity there. Like myself, this is my personal example. I went back to the United States for the last month to look for some land. And when I tried to talk to an insurance agent, they told me, I asked about earthquake insurance, and they told me, yes, we can give it to you, but... It only covers up to 10,000 U.S. dollars. That's it. Because they've had these quakes in this area, and they know if another 8.0 quake comes into the Tennessee Valley area, or up in Missouri Valley, or anywhere up that Mississippi Valley, Mississippi River area, that they'll never be able to pay off those claims. So they're limiting everybody to $10,000. You have to pay your premium every month but they'll only pay out $10,000 in coverage. So some of these things repeat, but they're silent until they repeat again. And these would be abrupt, fast changes like John's book talks about. You know, everywhere on this planet, we'll see tectonic activity as well as volcanic activity. And we're starting to see that around in Russia as we speak. There's three volcanoes going off there, and they're shooting ash, you know, 10 kilometers up into the sky. It only takes a few of those before it really has an effect on our weather. Exactly. I wrote an article in 2012, and I found that the single insurance premiums have gone up 400% or so in the U.S. in one year. I don't know where this trend went since then, or been not talked about anymore. Well, it was a big thing in 2012. Well, I can answer part of your question. Will they do, once you're going to buy some land, or when you do, and you want to construct a home, they do a quick survey to see if there's any existing sinkholes. If there's even any in your area, they will not insure you at all. It's impossible to get coverage. If it's an area that has no sinkholes currently, they will give you the coverage, but it's incredibly expensive. That, that's where it's at today. If it's anywhere even in your area, they won't cover your home. Now, these insurance companies must know something's going to increase in activity because they like to take the premiums in because most times things don't happen with the insurance company and the insurance industry. That's how they make their money because most times there's not the money for the claims because not that many things happen compared to how much money is coming in. But this seems to be, now they don't want your money anymore. I don't know why. Sinkholes and earthquake and floods, they don't want your money anymore. They're like, nope, we can't insure you. So what do they know that we are not being told? This is a full industry-wide thing in the United States. Well, I guess they're watching your videos, too. 
Now, if I could, let's talk about the wars and also the rent in the in the Scandinavian countries. You know, you had written about the property values and the rental properties had dropped by ninety percent during that time, just because so many people died off and there was no demand for real estate. Do you think we'll experience something like this again as we get into the grand solar minimum and there's loss of life across the planet into the hundreds and hundreds of millions of people this time? If not billions. It seems we're, we're moving in this direction. Because what happened at the time was um, historians usually attribute land abandonment to the Black Death. They assume many people died from a disease in uh, 1348, 51, and there were no more people to cultivate the land, right? So it turned out that um, land dissertation had started long before um, 20, uh, 1290 onwards. Coming out of this um, medieval warming period, which was sort of a golden age in the high middle ages. That's when they were cultivating grapes in the UK, which they can no longer do. So there was definitely a warmer climate back then than today. Much warmer, yes. They had um, orchard trees, apples. Um, quite high into Norway and wine into England. I don't know exactly how many hundred miles farther north than it's possible today. But um, it wasn't just temperature, of course, but with the high solar activity and all that cosmic rays, just a um, more steady weather and more predictable rainfall. So these, these were the good times in this uh, medieval climate optimum. Population had been thriving and increased. Uh, great advances were made in culture and technology and that certainly stopped in the early 1300s. And some glacier expanded, but it wasn't a measurable cooling, just more irregularities. And the land was had been abandoned already up to the um, the great famines which I mentioned. Now talking about the great famine, those People of that time were able to grow their own food locally and trade with other people locally within 25 miles or maybe say 40 kilometers or something around their area. Now, what do you, what's your feeling about today's you know, global delivery systems? Buying wheat in America and transporting it over to Europe, buying corn from China and bringing it into Europe. Which way, do you, in your opinion, do you think will have a higher survival rate? Today's delivery systems that rely on a world economy that has to stay together for things to be delivered, or those people at that time that grew their own food in their own homes and their own land? Well, it's obviously self-sustaining um, society and farmer communities can survive this much better. That's another misconception, of course, from um, history books. They would say, oh, well, that was bad, that was bad weather, but they'll live without sunburns. And historians today would say it's because they were self-sufficient and relied on local crops. So they couldn't uh, trade or import anything. That's why they starved. But of course, um, they did much 
Okay. Now, with the global system that we have right now, with the global economy, it has to stay functioning for the global delivery system to continue. If American economy collapses and the EU collapses, nobody's going to trust the banks or the companies or the letters of credit from one company to another from different countries and different continents. It's just not going to happen. We're going to have to use smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain at that point because currency won't work anymore. But we got to have a functioning world economy or else this delivery system fails. And if it doesn't work, then we're worse off than the local farmers in the 1300s. Uh, directly comparing to the uh, 14th century crisis, um, there's a misconception that the people of the time, they were self-sufficient farmers and not or so they didn't have the option to just import a fair crop trailers. And it's already one of the belief that that's why they all started up. And that couldn't happen today because we just import from somewhere else. But as it turns out, when there are all uh, global events and crop failures, nobody will want to export anyway, and nobody can if the markets collapse. And global distribution system will fail. So in the same events, we would be much worse off, let alone that um, even the agriculture of a local community depends on one spark huge from a tractor somewhere, which comes from China. That brings a good point. Even if the tractors stop running, how many people can really get out in the field with a plow and a cow, put a yoke on some animal and get that field plowed and put some seeds in the ground, get that thing harvested after they tend to it for three to four months, how can they, how many people even know how to harvest it, dry it, and then turn it into an edible food? Yeah, that's funny you mentioned that. It's, it's ridiculous anyway that we use up 12 calories in oil coming from the other world, in the world, to produce one calorie of food. There was an experiment here in Switzerland in World War II when they really put their efforts into self-sustainability. And it seems that it actually did work at the time. They brought back the horses and gave everybody a shovel and all that. So they were prepared to, it seems, in theory, they were prepared to be cut off from the world and still produce food. So we can see what we're up against here. And also, one last thing about the plague. Uh, in the United States and also in Australia, there's been several cities where the nuts, the natural food from the, the squirrels and the mice and the rats, the natural food that they would eat in the wild, due to the you know, the late freezes and then the early spring and then the, the cold came back and it killed off all the buds. So there's really not so many acorns or different kind of nuts and fruits this year. These millions and millions of mice are moving into cities and towns now in Australia and the United States. So the Black Death also was spread by, not all of course, but it was spread by rats and different kinds of mice and, you know, the rodents that were in the cities. But now we're starting to see the same thing where millions of rodents are coming into these modern cities because they don't have enough food in the wild, so they're 
coming into the city to look for food. If our immune system gets too weak, we'll start to get sick from the same things, but we have enough food to keep our immune system strong right now. But once we have less food and our immune system gets weak, these diseases are going to come back again. But the, the rodents are back in the cities here in America and also in Australia. Yeah, it's so it's sort of interesting um, strange animal behavior and migrations anywhere. But as I wrote in the text, um, the strain of disease is not quite uh, as clearly understood as we think. So um, people at the time didn't really write about the rats. And the interpretation of historians is that they were just used to them. There are lots of holes in these uh, translation patterns of the rats, so it's not that easy. If rats come in, then they bring diseases. But they can obviously be symptoms of cycles that are interrupted or collapsing. And if we see these migrations, then we should be prepared for, for change. One great change that I see coming is when the global economy collapses, people will still want to do business, but they will not trust currency anymore. They will not trust government-issued currencies. So my feeling is everything trading is going to move to a blockchain smart contract to get delivery of your goods because you can trade digital currency on that blockchain on a smart contract and it doesn't have to be with the government fake money. It will be digital currency that you can take out anywhere and trade for the local currency. And I really see this moving as this current system collapses and we still need food delivery. There'll still be some countries growing food and they will sell some, not all. Like today, we're not going to deliver nearly as much food as we do today. For sure, it will be cut back. 90%. But there will still be maybe 5 or 10% for export. Even 5%. They're not going to do traditional contracts, letters of credit like we do today from one bank to another bank because they will not know in 30 days if that country will, will the value of the money will decrease more. But a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain will stay in place. For sure, I think this is the future, but we got some serious problems that are coming with us, and I don't know why very few people are talking about this. It should be the mainstream front news every day. We as a world need to work to get ready for this, but it's just not. As for why people aren't talking about this, and I'm talking about traumatic induced amnesia coming back from Velenkovsky. I think that's why people want, don't want to talk about recurrences of such events. Trauma in the amnesia. It is, maybe. So scary what happened these last Maunder Minimum or the Wolf Minimum. You know, during the Maunder Minimum, 25% of the world's population perished. But it, uh, it wouldn't have to be that scary. If people are consciously aware of it, and as far as I can tell, the Maunder minimum it was just um, a gradual decline, and so people have time to adjust, and they just had less children. They have to move out of some of the some of the place they were living at. There was less of a overnight catastrophe and I can still see when I go to the Alps uh, you can still see the effects of the last little ice age it's quite fascinating there's the place called the lower Grindelwald glacier for instance where you can still see there's a big gouge going into the valley where it um, 
a load of houses back in the 1840s around there. They made the first railway up there to harvest ice for the industry and shipped it off to Germany. So that, that was um, that's quite impressive. You can still see the young trees and the low topsoil that was a uh, glacier. And now you have to hike up for two hours to see the glacier. That was very real for the people. But it seems that was more of a gradual, slow um, transfer into uninhabitable zones and the population seems to have declined gradually. But in the Black Death, it went itself, it you know, pretty quick since at some point. Which leads us to today. How fast are we going in? And if you saw the report I put out, I just compared Zarkova, Pokpov, Zarkov, and Shepard's work. They put out a couple different timelines of what you just talked about. How slow it was going into the modern minimum based on the northern and southern hemispheres of the sun in their canceling wave. There was so much, those 40, 45 years for them to get ready, and then the changes were more gradual, stepping down each year. But what we're going into right now, according to their work, is it is going to be an instant. I mean, two to three years, what took 45 years for the entry into the modern minimum, is literally going to take two to three years, and we're just going to drop that fast. So by 2021, we're going to be what would have taken 45 years of time into the modern minimum. We're going to experience that in these next two to three, which is a little <laughs> opens up a whole possibility of uh, outcomes there, I guess. Don't stick to any um, model or prediction for what we are seeing right now, but other than it could go either way for a while, I think. But the abrupt cooling is, uh, is the most probable, obviously. Um, just go to abruptearthchanges.com and it's in the upper right hand corner. Just click on it. Uh, I, I put the updated version on today well we'll leave it at that and uh we'll let everybody do their own research and speaking of that tell everybody how they can find your pdf black death and abrupt earth change to the 14th century pdf how can they find this and download it um just go to about and it's in the upper right hand corner just click on it and Sacha, thank you so much for spending your time with me and explaining to everybody about your research and what we're seeing in today's world. And again, everybody can check out the website, abruptearthchanges.com. Okay, thank you, too. I'll see you all the time. Bye, David. And I do thank you so much for spending your valuable time listening to Sasha and myself discuss repeating cycles in history. We're going to see this again. It's beginning right now. I hope we can use this as a platform so we can all start to compare information. Please leave a comment or a note below. Pass this through your social media. In our next talk, I'm going to be discussing crop losses globally with Bob Kudla from Trade Genius. A lot of what we are going to speak about has not been making it into the mainstream news media, so I think you're going to learn a lot. Join us for the next episode.